Oh, I love me a Green Party crowd. You guys are always so polite. As soon as somebody gets to the mic, you all settle in. Sorry. Am I quiet? Yes. Not something we hear very often, right, Michael? Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, the people of the Three Fires, known as the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations. And it further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. I would also like to thank Lee. Um, for many, I, I, many recognizable faces out there today, and many of us have been in this space, and I'd, I'd like to thank Lee for um, providing a place uh, uh, in this community where anyone uh, can come and uh, find a space uh, to utilize their voice. And so thank you so much for that. <laughs> One of my uh, favorite memories of this building is actually getting some Green Party training um, as uh, NDPers were running through to go to their meeting in this room over here. And I think that um, is symbolic of what a uh, place Lee has provided here. Um, so speaking of being in this space for Green Party stuff, on March 12th, we will be holding our AGM um, for both the provincial as well as the federal side. So um, for those of you who have uh, lecture memberships laps, uh, please attend to that. Um, and uh, you can do that online. And, and of course, uh, I ask you um, if you would be willing to please uh, direct uh, that those membership funds to Bruce Gray Owen Sand. Um, uh, what else did I want to say? Oh, in addition to that, if you do, um, of course, you can come to the AGM as uh, just to listen, but to vote or to become part of the executive, uh, you do need a membership. So uh, please uh, look into that. And if you have any questions, uh, let me know. So it is my distinct honor. I have had such a lovely, lovely day. And anybody who knows me well enough knows. Uh, um, that last, it, it was like Christmas Eve last night because I got to hang out today with Mike Schreiner. Um, so uh, in, in 2019, Mike celebrated 10 years as the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. And the growth that this party has undertaken is phenomenal. We have more members, we have more staff, we have more money, and, and just more of everything. Um, largely, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to Mike. Um, in his first year, Mike led the charge to defend the Greenbelt. He introduced a private member's bill to protect our drinking water. He launched a campaign to protect endangered species from Bill 108. He developed, and this is, might be my favorite part, he developed the most comprehensive plan to tackle the housing crisis that's out there. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Schreiner. So, uh, Danielle, thank you for that kind introduction. You're going to give me a big head here. Uh, I, it was great spending the day with you as well. Um, I've uh, never toured a nuclear facility in my life, and Bruce Power, the day I was elected, invited me to um, tour their facility. They've been on me to do that ever since, and so I finally said I would do it today, only so I would have an excuse to then come to Owen Sound and hang out with all of you and spend the day with Danielle. And so thank you for stepping up and uh, running in the federal election. I, I deeply appreciate that. And I also want to thank you for the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement to open tonight. I know every decision I make at Queen's Park, I always draw on Indigenous wisdom, thinking about um, the wisdom of the seven generations that preceded us and applying that to decisions and thinking through how that's going to affect the seven generations that follow us. The one thing I would add about um, accomplishments this year, and I just only really want to say this, not to brag, but just to say that when I was first elected, people uh, sort of dismissed me as, what can one green do? 
Can you really accomplish anything? And I think we've accomplished a number of things. One of the biggest ones I was so proud of was about last year at this time, we were leading the charge to protect the green belt. And so there's been a lot of talk about ways in which the Ford government's backtracked on various legislation. The first one was Schedule 10 of Bill 66, which would have opened the green belt for development and undermined the Clean Water Act. I was the first person to ask a question on it. And um, I talked about, um, in asking those questions, I talked about what happened in Walkerton, um, because it's a tragedy that we could never forget. And most of our Clean Water Act legislation was brought in in response to that. And so I think to bring in any bill that would undermine that was a mistake. And I was told by the opposition, by the government, the other side, that I should be ashamed of myself for that. But lo and behold, a month and a half later, one of the proudest votes I ever cast was withdrawing that schedule from Bill 66 so we could continue to protect our water and our green belt. And then the other one is, is um, uh, people said, well, you know, uh, would you ever get anything passed? And the very first private member's bill passed under this government was a bill I co-sponsored, Bill 123 with Warren Coe, who's a conservative MPP. Uh, and so if you don't have an electric car and you park in an electric charging spot, you're going to get charged $125 now. So I'm just warning you, <laughs> those of you who like me drive electric vehicles are probably very happy that I was able to work with the conservatives to get this passed. And I want to tell one quick story about that and I'm going to go into a little bit of a speech and I'm going to open up the questions. So I have an electric vehicle and I oftentimes obviously drive between Guelph and Toronto all the time. And uh, there's this thing called the Toronto Premium Outlet Mall. I don't know why it's called that because it's in Halton Hills. But anyway, that's another story. I oftentimes park there to charge my car. And I go in and have a coffee and I work for an hour. And so one day, about three weeks before the bill was up for debate, I got the last charging spot. And a gentleman drove up and he's like, oh, I'm almost out of battery power and I need to charge. And there's like two gas-powered cars parked here. Somebody's got to do something about this. He was very upset, and he said a few other choice words, which there's some young people here, so I have to be a family a bit today. So I put my arm around him. I just patted him on the back, and I said, Sir, don't worry. I'm on this. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, Oh, you're going to get him towed? And I said, Well, maybe not that short term. That, but long term, I'm going to fix this for you. And he finally, and so we we're chatting, he finally looked at me, he's like, who the heck are you anyway? And I said, well, I'm the MVP for Guelph. This is my electric car right here. And I've introduced this private member's bill and I, uh, along with a conservative member, and I hope it's going to pass. And he's like, I will vote for you if it passes. And I've never voted green in my life. I said, great. <laughs> So anyway, hopefully he remembers me. I did it, I should have got his, like, I actually violated the rule of campaigning. I didn't get his name, email, and phone number. I should have done that. But anyway, I'll learn next time. You gotta learn to not, uh, you gotta learn, yeah, anyway. I, it's, it's a real honor to be here, and it's an important moment to be here. And the reason is, is 2020 is a critical year. You know, when the IPCC report came out, around the climate crisis, and the media said we had 12, that was like the fall of 2018, and the media said we have 12 years to address this crisis. What they didn't say, and this is what is so critically important, is that global scientists say, that, and they said this at the time, that if the trajectory of global GHG emissions do not start going down, so peak in 2020, we are not going to reach our climate goals for 2030. And in 2030, we unleash catastrophic climate change. And we're seeing it. I mean, we're seeing it in the fires in Australia. We're seeing it in the fires in the Amazon. We're seeing the flooding in Ontario. $1.3 billion worth of damage in this province alone last year. $80 million in three hours. A severe rainstorm in Toronto last August. The statistics go on and on and on, but I'm not here to scare you. Though I am here to tell you 2020 is a critical moment. But what I want, the message I want to get across is it's also a golden opportunity. It's an opportunity to simultaneously localize our economies, to reinvigorate and make them more resilient through supporting local farming, local manufacturing, the trades, the caring professions, 
to strengthen and relocalize our economies. And I tell people that, you know, farmers in particular, and I grew up on a farm, are on the front lines of the climate crisis, but they're on the front lines of delivering the solutions to that crisis. But simultaneously, we have an opportunity to embrace and succeed in the $26 trillion global clean economy. We know that over the next five years, global automakers are going to invest $255 billion rolling out electric vehicles. We know that every single year, $355 billion are going to be invested in renewable energy projects globally. And the question is, is Ontario going to lead that transition, creating jobs and generating prosperity in our economy, or are we going to lose jobs to it? And while we're creating those jobs, are we going to invest the money in our communities to create a caring economy? Because the bottom line is the caring professions are low carbon jobs and they're jobs that make our communities vital, vibrant places to live. The people who educate us, who care for us, who provide mental health services, who, um, who uh, provide care for the elderly in our community, who look out for people who have accessibility issues, are we going to invest in that? Because right now, we have a provincial government that's cutting funding to those programs instead of investing in those programs, and they're doing it in the name of deficit reduction. And the thing I will remind people is, is in Ontario, we have the lowest per capita spending of any province in the country, and we also have the lowest per capita revenue of any province in the country, and it's primarily because we don't charge enough for our resources. And so we can actually increase revenue by increasing resource royalty rates, and we can invest that in communities, in education, in healthcare, in social services, in affordable housing. Every community I go to, people talk about the fact that they can't afford to even buy a house, in many cases pay rent. And while we're at it, we need to make those homes energy efficient because we know that the lowest cost solution to rising energy prices. And I understand there are a lot of people who are challenged between choosing between heating and eating. The lowest cost solution is to invest in energy efficiency, to make our homes more efficient so we can save money by saving energy. And that means hiring people in the trades, architects, electricians, builders, uh, uh, roofers, etc. And so we can build a strong climate resilient economy that creates jobs and benefits our communities and makes life more affordable for people. And I want to close on that by saying, if we're going to do that, we have to make a commitment to protecting the people and places we love. And that means protecting prime farmland in this province. We're losing 365 acres of farmland each and every year in Ontario. That is unsustainable. It's actually more jobs are created in the food and farming sector than any other sector of our economy, over 800,000 jobs. Who would want to pave over the asset base to create those jobs? We roll back, we, the current provincial government, roll back protections for water to the point that at committee hearings and the committee I'm on, AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, came to committee and asked for something I'd never heard of before. They asked for municipal councils to receive indemnity from their legal obligation to protect water because they felt like the provincial government had undermined water regulations to such an extent in the name of red tape reduction that they felt that it was unreasonable to ask municipalities to continue to bear that legal liability. That has to change. I'm sorry, your health, your water, our farmland is not red tape. And so we can reduce real red tape, paperwork and things like that, without undermining the protections of the places we love and the people we want to care for in this province. And I think the only way we're going to deliver that is by delivering a new way of doing politics. And I think one of the reasons, when I first became leader 10 years ago, nobody thought a Green could get elected. Even Elizabeth May hadn't been elected at that point. Matter of fact, people thought maybe we could elect Shane Jolly here at Bruce Gray Hood South so we can talk about how do we revitalize that. But um, nobody thought a Green could get elected. Now there are 18 elected Greens at the provincial or federal level across the country. Nobody thought we could elect a Green in Upper Canada, and we proved that wrong in Guelph, obviously, in the last provincial election. And I think one of the reasons Greens are getting elected 
is because we're a political party that's about putting people before politics. We're a party that's about putting what's good, good public policy against the toxic partisanship we see. I can't tell you how many times I sit at Queens Park and I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for my colleagues who hurdle insults back and forth towards each other. I'm embarrassed that I was attacked by one party because I had the audacity to work with a party who I've been very critical of. I've been very critical, a harsh critic of the Ford government. But if they're going to, I'm happy to work with a conservative to put forward a bill and get it passed that's going to make life better for people. Because I think we have to end this toxic partisanship that says just because somebody else who's on another team puts forward a good idea that we're not going to support it. And I think one of the things that people are being attracted to Greens is we're saying, you know what, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can be critical of others when they don't do things we believe in, but we can stand on our principles and our values and to be honest with people and support a party when they put forward an idea that we believe in. And I think that's what Canadians want. They just want politicians to get things done. They're sick and tired of the partisan games. And so that's the commitment I made to the people of Guelph. That's the commitment I'm asking every Green candidate uh, in this province to make as we prepare for the next provincial election. Because we can't. We can't negotiate with physics. We can't negotiate with nature. We have to start working together and creating a broad coalition of people across the political spectrum to deliver the transformative change this province and this country needs. And together, together, we can do that. So I really want to thank you for being here tonight. I'm very much looking forward to answering questions because I feel like every time I travel around the province and all the new communities I go to, I learn more from listening to people than I ever do uh, reading <laughs> government reports at Queen's Park. So please start firing away your questions. And also, if you have any great ideas, I'm happy to listen to those as well. But if you would keep it short, because I want to give everybody an opportunity to speak. And so please be respectful of everyone in the room. So thank you so much for being here today. Now, I, don't, I didn't bring a ton of handlers with me, so I didn't talk to anybody how we were going to handle this, but there is a microphone there, so people are happy to come up to the microphone. There's also a small enough room that if you just want to get up and ask a question, I'm happy to repeat it back to the audience. Yeah, go ahead. And maybe just say your name real quick, if you don't oh, mind. Yeah, I'm Logan. Okay. And uh, well, well, a bunch of climate scientists and the latest IPCC draft have uh, talked about uh, food security mm -hmm. issues, uh, especially with climate change that they're saying, like... 2040, 2050 range, there could be kind of a global famine, mm -hmm. and that a lot of uh, our regular crops may not produce. And so I was wondering, um, in, in terms of funding for, uh, public funding for agricultural research, because mm -hmm. I, I was talking to John Sulik from uh, Guelph Agroecology, yeah. and they were saying that they only get privately funded, and uh, the, the private funding is, is basically just milking the farmers. <laughs> yeah. Sure, great question. Yeah. Yeah. So, Two parts. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. I, yep. I, just, okay. just, one, one last part was uh, the that I just had uh, kind of this idea of edible food forest mm -hmm. domes as a kind of a housing. Well, it's, it's, it meets all basic needs in terms of you can have all of your food, your water, your energy, and community needs within a 15 meter radius mm -hmm. uh, by having a food forest. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. All fantastic questions. So first of all, I will say there is public research for agriculture. And I can say that I, and I, I know that because I'm an MPP who represents the University of Guelph, which receives most of that funding. Um, some of it's not always oriented towards sustainable agriculture or agroecology or regenerative agriculture, um, but there is public money going into agriculture. And one of the promising, and, and I say, I'm going to say this to somebody, I grew up on a conventional farm. Uh, my parents, we cash cropped and raised cattle. And so, you know, it was a pretty large farm, 2,000 acres. So, you know, we're like fairly big farm. And I also started one of Ontario's first local organic food businesses and have operated a number of organic food businesses. So I'm one of these people who sort of worked on both sides of the debate between conventional and organic agriculture. And there's some, I think, some really promising technological advances that are happening, a lot of it coming out of the University of Guelph that is starting to narrow the divide between conventional and organic agriculture. A lot of it's called precision agriculture, where you're actually looking at um, 
using soil testing combined with uh, GPS data to significantly reduce the amount of pesticides and fertilizers that farmers in the conventional sector use. And farmers like it because you save money. Like, who wants to spend money on all? Like, most farmers don't want to spend money on these chemicals, but they, they kind of have to due to market conditions. So here's a way to actually use technology to um, significantly reduce um, uh, uh, chemical inputs while still maintaining and even increasing yields. So there are some advances happening. There's also some huge advances happening within regenerative agriculture, organic agriculture, and other forms of sustainable agriculture to the point where in many cases, you're starting to see a number of organic producers now uh, acquiring yields that are comparable or even exceed conventional agriculture. So you're starting to see, I think, a lot of opportunities to come together. I think one of the biggest roles government can play are in, in three important areas. So first of all, I think we need more government investment in local um, uh, uh, food infrastructure. So uh, local food processing, we've lost almost all of our small to medium sized food processors, particularly abattoirs especially, uh, which puts significant pressure on local food systems. Um, a lot of our, our uh, local input suppliers, our local supply chains, and so particularly in the processing sector, having more of that capacity in place will support local farmers more and support um, um, people who want to be a part of a local food system, whether through a farmer's market or your local independent grocer or whatever. Secondly, um, one of the things I've been advocating for is actually paying farmers to provide environmental goods and services. One of the concerns farmers have, particularly as we put price on pollution, which we absolutely need to do, is that increases input costs. Well, if you're going to ask farmers to deliver climate solutions, which we are, then I think we as society should pay them for those solutions, which then makes more sustainable practices, more affordable and more profitable for, for farmers. And then the final point I would make is um, we have to look at, and this is partly connected to local food systems, is... Um, this is more of a problem in the U.S. and in Canada, but it's how do we reduce the large mega farms? So one of the reasons I've been a huge supporter of supply management in dairy, for example, is the average dairy farm in Ontario is about 88 cows. In the United States, you have dairy facilities that have 50,000 cows. And so that's the difference between having policies in place like supply management, which protect family farms, versus just completely having a free market, which leads you down the path to huge corporate farming. And so we in Canada need to do everything we can to protect our family farms and our family farmers. Yeah, so go ahead. <clears throat> My name's Barry. And, uh, Barry, we work together at Hillside. So if any of you want to come down to Guelph, and uh, volunteer at Hillside, Hillside you're more than welcome to join us. <laughs> Hillside is the wealth equivalent of Summerfield. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so it's good to see you in your native habitat. Exactly. Well, I'm a new resident of this riding uh, for 25 years after moving out of Guelph. Yep. I lived in Walkerton and uh, experienced the water, water crisis. Yeah. And that partly was a motivation to continue working in the environmental field. Mm -hmm. uh, my office now is just up in the corner there, the Great New Sustainability Network. So it's open to new projects and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. People want to get involved in, in that kind of work. But uh, one of the things I try and focus on is the economic development benefit mm -hmm. and new jobs and that sort of thing. And often I get <coughs> the idea, well, you need to invest this now because the return will come in those health benefits in the future yep. or the, that, those kinds of things. And so. And that's where the, the carbon credit, or not yeah. use the word tax, but the carbon credit idea, yeah. um, I think it's a really good one. Um, could you just give us a little update on the current status and then what the, perhaps the next steps are for Ontario yeah, in terms sure. of reinstating some kind of you know, cash benefit for good work that people are doing? Yeah, no, great question. So I think, so one of the things that was very challenging when the Ford government first was elected was one of the first things they did was cancel all most of the green rebate programs, whether it's for people, you know, retrofitting their homes or wanting to buy electric vehicles, etc. And I can't tell you how many phone calls, emails, people came into my office who were planning or already well underway of completely retrofitting their homes to make them more energy efficient, and then 
had literally the rug pulled out from under them or the money pulled out of their wallet, literally. And so to me, it was just such a horrible policy decision. And here's why. So think about it. You know, people talk about rising energy prices, and it is huge. People talk about energy poverty. The cheapest way to, you know, uh, address that issue is to help people save money by saving energy. But people need help to do that. A great way to create jobs. I mean, all of these were huge job creators. I mean, think about your local tradespeople installing windows, insulation, uh, more efficient heating systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, huge job creators. As a matter of fact, the statistics show for every dollar invested in the fossil fuel sector, you create seven times more jobs if you invested in actually saving energy. So it's a huge job creator. And so we're actively advocating for the government to rethink that. Because I don't think they're going to be able to deliver on their promise to further reduce electricity prices by 12%. As a matter of fact, pr electric prices are continuing to go up. So if you really want to help people save money, help them use less and use it more efficiently. The other point I want to make on that, and this is an economic point, and this is something I just can't get through to the Premier on, but Ontario ships... 16 to 24 billion dollars out of our economy every year to buy fossil fuels from other jurisdictions. Imagine if we kept that money in Ontario, investing in Ontario jobs, creating wealth in this province, and we have the capacity to do that. So I would argue it's an economic imperative for Ontario to keep that money in our province, creating jobs, generating economic activity, and providing the tax base to fund health care and education and other important social services. Yeah, so go ahead. Hi. My name is Brian O'Doherty. I live next door. Okay. Someone has parked oh. <laughs> right in front of my driveway. Thanks for coming in, Brian. It's a GMC truck, 833-something XL, I think. If, if one of you have parked there, could you please move it so I can... Okay. Get to the why. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll, uh, uh, we can all avert our eyes. We're going to avert our eyes so whoever gets up and leaves, we're not going to tease you or give you a rough time about this, okay? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Clark, and um, I'm glad I didn't park there so I can ask this question. Um, the last answer was very much along the idea of money and economics. Yeah. Exactly. This week, BlackRock, yes, largest yep. investment That's corporation right. in the world mm -hmm. that has seven trillion dollars, yep. just said that they are going to change their focus to climate change, climate yep. mitigation. What is the Green Party's plan in the next two years to partner with big business? Yeah. who is seeing the light and is yeah. changing their attitudes yep. and directing money towards green as opposed to carbon yeah. so that your voice becomes greater and louder with business behind it. Yeah, that's a great, so it's a great question and I'm, we're already working on that. And if you just want to get a little proof for that, do any of you know Richard Petty? He was the CEO of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. So I know those of you who are Leaf fans may not like Richard too well. He admits the Leafs didn't perform as well as he would have liked while he was their CEO. But financially, they, they made a lot of money. Anyway, he is probably one of my biggest fans and one of the biggest um, climate advocates out there. And so we've been actively working with people uh, in the business community, particularly in the venture capital community, because one of the challenges we're facing in, as a matter of fact, there was a, just an editorial in the Globe and Mail about this just a couple days ago, is Canada's very good at research and development. And so a lot of the technologies that are gonna transform our economy are actually made in Ontario, made in Canada, but especially made in Ontario technology. But what we haven't succeeded in is scaling and commercializing it. So a lot of our Made in Canada technology is either being purchased by other countries or being implemented in other countries. And so one of the challenges we face is how do we mobilize money in Ontario to support the creation of Ontario jobs in the new economy? And so one of the ways to do that is, is um, looking at, mostly looking at our tax structure. So providing tax benefits to, um, uh, uh, accelerated capital depreciation, 
uh, our, um, additional RSP opportunities for local investment to help mobilize using government procurement. The government of Ontario procure is one of the largest purchasers of products in the province. We should, everything the government spends should be on sustainable products, uh, zero carbon products. So utilizing those tools to assist and promote our own businesses. I was actually a part of an announcement this morning that's really exciting. The city of Guelph, and I'm challenging every city to follow Guelph's lead. We just announced that um, immediately we're purchasing 35 electric buses, made in Canada electric buses. And over the next five years, we're going to electrify the entire city's bus fleet. Um, $100 million committed by Guelph, um, and then provincial and federal money as well. So Catherine McKenna was there to announce that we had. And so those are the kinds of ways in which government procurement can catalyze um, this transition. And so, you know, I mean, one, we need more investment in public transit, period. But we need to make sure it's an investment in electrified public transit. So by all means, the business community, and not just the small business community, but the large business communities coming around. I've had both um, GM and Ford senior executives reach out to me because I've been going on and on about the fact that Ontario doesn't have an electric vehicle strategy. So when GM closed their Oshawa plant, I actually met with Premier Ford the next morning. And I said to him, we bumped into each other, and he said, you're not going to blame me for the GM closure, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. I know it's not your fault. You haven't been around long enough. But here's your opportunity to develop an EV strategy for Ontario and tell global investors that Ontario is the place to invest in electric vehicles. And he said, yes, let's meet about that. And then two hours later, he gave a news conference railing on Trudeau and the carbon price. And I just thought, oh, well, there goes my chance of working with this guy. But anyway, so but I still kept at it. And, uh, but if you look at the vehicle strategy they put out, it doesn't even mention electric vehicles. So I've had Tesla reach out to me, I've had Ford, Chevy, I've had a number of automakers say, you know what, you're the guy talking about this, like how do we get Ontario on side to actually do that? I mean, we're, we should be the global leader in electric, electric vehicle manufacturing. Unfortunately, we're not right now. China just announced $500 billion investment in electrifying their, their country's vehicle fleet. So, so big, big, even big business is coming on side and we're gonna to continue to work with them to mobilize the kinds of investments we need to uh, deliver that kind of change. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is David Walton. Um, and I know the Green Party's on board with uh, electoral reform, but we really yeah. need electoral yes. reform. I totally agree with and, you. And uh, just another, just a suggestion, and I've sent this on to the federal level, I think the parliament and the legislature should be, everybody should be mixed up. We shouldn't be set up as teams fighting agree against each other. Yep. And maybe you could put a private member's <laughs> bill forward to, to have everybody in alphabetical order <laughs> rather than conservatives, liberals, and yeah. fighting against each other. Yeah. Thank you. So actually, you raise a great suggestion. So I don't know how many of you know how parliament is set up, both provincially and federally. So we sit as caucuses, and believe it or not, between the government and opposition, the separation is two sword links. Because, you know, you don't want to get into a sword fight. You want to make sure that if you are in a sword fight, you can't reach across the aisle. Like, that's the kind of mentality that exists. And so one of the best things that's happening at Queen's Park right now is we have an unprecedented number of independents sitting in the legislature. So the Green, like me being elected in the last election, was the first time a fourth party has been elected to the Ontario legislature since the 1944 election. And because the Liberals didn't win enough seats to have an official party status, they sit as independents. And the Conservatives have kicked out three members, so they sit as independents. So we actually have 11 independent members in the legislature right now. And having us, having us all sit together has actually been amazing. Because we've learned, like, Randy Hillier is about the most anti... He got kicked out of the Conservative Party. He's about the most anti-green. I don't think he thinks climate change. He's a climate denier. But somehow the two of us have still figured out a way to work together. And I think part of it is because we sit next to each other. We have to talk to each other every day. And so you're absolutely right. On electoral reform, I'm going to ask you all to do something for me. So I think we have a real shot at electoral reform in the next Ontario election. But I need you to put pressure on the Liberal leadership candidates right now. About half of them support electoral reform and half of them don't. And unfortunately, the front runner doesn't. 
Um, and the conversations I've had with both the NDP and the Liberals at Queen's Park is, is I want all three opposition parties to go into the next provincial election supporting electoral reform. And I'd like to come out of the next provincial election with electoral reform front and center on the agenda. And part of my motivation for this is I think the only way we're going to get bold climate action is through a minority government. It's incredibly hard for a majority government to deliver it because they, they, they take all the heat. And so what I've told my liberal NDP friends, I've said, you know, not likely we're going to have a green government after the next election, but by gosh, we're going to elect five or six greens and we're going to have a minority government and we can have bold climate action. And I am more than happy to have you blame it all on me. Just say those greens made us do it and we'll take the heat. Because I just want the action to happen. But I think, so I think you've seen in BC with the BC Clean Plan, how the Greens and NDP have worked together to deliver climate solutions. I'm hoping federally, now that it's a minority government, that the government's going to become more bold on climate because they're going to need support from probably the Bloc and the NDP and the Greens. And so I think we can do it provincially as well, but I think it's going to take a minority government. And so I need you, but I need all of you to work at least on the Liberals. I don't think we're going to make much progress with the Conservatives, given the conversations I've had, though you could argue after the last federal election, Conservatives should be supporting proportional representation. That's another story. But, um, but I'm hoping we can deliver it after the next provincial election. Yeah. Do you, want, do you mind just the gentleman behind you hasn't asked a question yet, and you've asked one. So do you mind just, yeah, then, yeah just to, so people can get their first question in? Thanks. You mentioned, uh, my name is Gord, Gord Trimble. Uh, you mentioned in your introduction that uh, Land, agricultural land is being transformed with pavement over top of it. Well, yep. we're also losing a lot of land to landfills. Yes, we are. So yep. Things going in there that shouldn't yep. be going in, and in the end, we create all kinds of methane gas, which has yes. way more devastating effects than exactly. like CO2. Yep. What do you think needs to be done? I know there is has been in the past yep. some action on it. Uh, I think we're going the wrong way on that one, too. Where, yeah. where, where do you think we should go on that one? Yeah, it's a great question. And thank you so much for asking that because it's an, an important issue that doesn't get talked enough about in Ontario. So the previous Liberal government passed the Waste-Free Ontario Act, but the act just allows for regulations to be developed. And so right now, the, so the current government is developing the regulations under that act. And so I've been pushing and pushing and pushing them. And I think they're listening. Minister Yurik, who's the Environment Minister, we've had some good meetings on this. And the, how I've pitched it to them is, is that um, get garbage off the backs of taxpayers. One of the biggest municipal tax bills is dealing with garbage. And so we as taxpayers, I'm trying to put this in Ford language, we as taxpayers are subsidizing these big companies to produce garbage. And half the time we go to the store and you want to buy a little something and it's got so much plastic around it, you don't even have a choice whether to reduce the garbage or not. So the best way to do that is to shift the cost burden off of us as citizens and onto the companies that produce the garbage in the first place. It's called extended producer responsibility or individual producer responsibility laws. I'm hoping that that's the regulatory framework they come out with. They seem to be heading in that direction, and I've been trying to tell them, like, there's a very conservative argument that you could put forward to deliver this. So the question is, is are the industry lobbyists going to win out, or are the people going to win out? And I'm hoping the people are going to win out on this one. The other one that's really important to me we've been calling for is a ban on single-use plastics. Like, we just, like, we, we just, it's just unsustainable, the levels of plastic pollution we're, we're producing. A lot of it, they say they recycle it, but a lot of it ends up not getting recycled. And so, um, you know, do we really need, you know, single-use water bottles or cocaine, Coke bottles, you know, like um, straws? Like, there's so many, like, plastic bags. There's so many things. There's just so many, like, common-sense, everyday alternatives to. And so bringing in a single-use plastic ban, I think, is absolute, is, is, is critical. Uh, and then the final one is, and this is my least favorite of the solutions I'm going to offer, but it's an important one only because the amount of GHG emissions that are happening. The cement industry is one of the most carbon intensive industries um, on earth, but we're not going to not produce cement anytime soon. I mean, can you, like, I just don't see it happening. They use coal right now to um, fire their kilns. 
And that's why there is so much carbon emitting. They've been asking for the government to bring in a regulation that would just allow them to use an alternative fuel standards. And so they could actually start using a number of things, divert things out of landfill that would go into their kilns that would replace coal and would be a significant reduction in, in GHG emissions. And so I see that as a short-term interim solution why we're looking at an alternative to cement or alternative to how we um, um, heat uh, the, those kilns in a way that is sustainable and carbon neutral. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you before. That's okay. Uh, so, well, with the GIS software, uh, I know that was one of the issues kind of that I was talking about is that these private software companies are funding uh, these agroecology professors to just teach their students how to use their software so that they yeah. buy the software. Yeah. Um, but they're not actually uh, teaching them, say, like no-till agriculture, which would possibly yep. get us to yep. net zero by 2050, because, yeah. because obviously tilling uh, yeah. you know, yeah. produces lots of carbon. Yeah. But uh, I'm mostly... I, I'm just just like it really interrupt really quick. Okay, sure, All these systems are as part of a no-till system. Oh. And I can say that, like when I said I grew up on a conventional farm, the one good thing my dad did do is he started doing no-till agriculture back in the early 90s, before most people had even heard of what no-till agriculture is. The challenge with no-till, it's great on the carbon front, but oftentimes you use heavier chemical loads in no-till agriculture because instead of tilling weeds, you're, you're using, you're using more, more uh, herbicides. And so what the precision agriculture allows you to do is do no tillage and significantly reduce your herbicide inputs because now you can do um, precision applications. Just, so I just want to... Okay, that, yeah. that's great, thanks. Um, yeah, the main, main thing I, uh, was um, kind of my proposal with the, you know how there's a basic income yes. uh, kind of yep. strategy? Yeah, but we're so, a big supporter of it. Yeah. Right. So, so my kind of alternative was a kind of a basic land strategy. Okay. So say, for instance, if you have a hectare of land and you have an edible food forest on it, mm -hmm. then you could support a family of four to six on it. So you're providing the housing, you know, the mm -hmm. basic needs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and the food, mm -hmm. and the water, mm -hmm. and the energy, because uh, you can coppice wood, right. know, yep. and that, that kind of stuff, and have solar panels. Do you have a question, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, I was wondering what your, um, what you think of, of the basic land idea, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it, because it's a okay, basically an example of sustainable, you know, zero carbon footprint. Yep. Living. Yeah, great. So great question. So one of the things that I've been a big supporter of, the Green Party's been a big supporter of, is um, making more land affordable for smaller scale agricultural production. There's a lot of young people in particular who want to go into agriculture, into farming, but they can't access the land because they can't afford it. So I've been, actually, before I got into politics and then subsequently was involved in setting up what we were calling agricultural condominiums, which were essentially looking at taking public lands, particularly conservation lands, and making them available for small plot agriculture that could actually deliver on uh, uh, many aspects of the idea that you just articulated. And the province has the ability to do that because most of that public land is owned by the provincial government. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Teresa. Hi. Um, now, obviously, you've run in more than one provincial election yes. before you. I did. Elected. It took a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> trust me. And that's my question is, you know, through those years, how do you keep the energy up yeah. and um, inspire the persistence in those around you yeah. to get to where you are. I, I know that the Green Party, like the power is the people that you Absolutely. have working with it. So do you have any suggestions for us in how we can inspire and keep that momentum going yeah. and hopefully get a green yeah. Person elected yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, I just want to give all of you a warning, and I joke with people a lot about this, but I'm slightly serious, that if you feel less energetic when you leave tonight, it's because I've sucked the energy out of you. I literally, for me personally, the energy that keeps me going are the people in this room. And because I know we're in this together, and I know the only way we're going to deliver the change we need is through people power. We don't have the deep pockets, you know, we don't, we don't 
hold the power. We don't have 150 years of, quote, brand equity that, you know, your great-grandparents voted this way, so you vote this way. Um, and it's the people in this room that gives me energy. And it's the people in this room that's going to deliver the change we need. And so a suggestion that I would offer, uh, and then we employed this in Guelph, and if I look at other writings that we've elected Greens, is to pick an issue that you all can mobilize around and you can go out and campaign to your community. And, and the reason, and it just needs to be one, like sometimes you can get spread too thin on too many. And so what we did in Guelph is we went to our, the community, this was way back in like 2013, um, we went to the community and we said, if there was one issue that we worked on, what would it be? And the, overwhelmingly the community said, we did, we did polling and we did like Facebook polls and door-to-door -door polls. We put ads in the paper. So we, you know, it wasn't like a scientific sample. And overwhelmingly it was water. So for many years, I ran a campaign to protect Guelph's water from the Doline Quarry, uh, which we're actually about ready to close this quarry. It's like six years later, and a year and a half into my term as MVP, I think we're gonna finally get this quarry closed. But we went door to door, we had signs up for it, stop the quarry, we collected petition signatures, we got city council on side, and it was just a grassroots movement. And the, but the reason I think it's important to do one is that you can, get, you can get spread too thin. So if you can find a unifying issue, and this issue attracted people left, right, center, people who had never been involved in politics. Like it was just, it was a big community building exercise. And, and then the great thing about doing something like that is even if you don't get elected, if you stop the quarry, you succeeded. So who cares? So getting elected is like the cherry on top of the cake, you know? So that would be my recommendation. And could, I mean, you have, like, if just even a quarter of the people in this room got involved in this campaign. And, you know, we took it to farmers markets. We took it to community events. Like, we just went everywhere and pushed and pushed and pushed and just built a movement. And then that movement ultimately translated into electing me as an MPP. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Leah. Um, I think I have a piece of that propaganda stop the quarry stuff. You probably do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, prevalently my question is twofold. Currently we're in a position in Ontario regarding the educational future of our yes. children. Yeah. Nine grandchildren and my grandmother's 100, so 14 years running five generations. And um, I, I'm seeing this great divide of expense in the uprise of technology yeah. and the decrease of our education budget. Yeah. And I'd like you to kind of address where that is in the House and, and of course, the Green Party position <coughs> that's going to be for the future. <laughs> yeah, right? absolutely. Our children. Yeah. So one of the things I've been doing in, is, uh, so I've been walking the picket lines with teachers. Um, and I, I think the public is really on side with, the, with teachers and educational staff right now. Because the real battle here isn't so much about compensation, which is how the government's trying to frame it, but it's about mandatory e-learning, which has not been tried in any jurisdiction in the world. The closest example we have is Alabama in the United States, which I think ranks 50th out of 50 states in terms of educational quality. So. I'm not, I don't understand why the government wants to model Ontario education after Alabama, but anyway. And then the other one is increasing in class sizes. So we've already, which is essentially a backhanded way of cutting funding for education. Uh, to take 10,000, and they backtrack a bit now, we're looking at maybe four to 5,000, but even if it's, it's 10,000, it's catastrophic, but even at taking 5,000 educators out of our children's classrooms, will have a catastrophic effect on Ontario's education. And what I find so ironic, and I pointed this out with the media um, the other day, when the government announced their ads for tradespeople, the courses that are actually being cut in our schools are the courses for people in the trades, because those are the classes that you know, require like nine, 10 people. So if you're gonna keep those courses while raising average class sizes, the other classes are gonna be like 40 plus people. It's gonna be completely unsustainable. So the irony of them encouraging kids to go into the trades while essentially cutting 
the trades out of our schools makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Just going from an average class size of 22 to 22.5, which we've experienced this year, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to my office because their kids can't get the courses they need to graduate or their program was cut or, or what have you. So imagine what it's going to be like if we go to an average class size of 25 or God forbid 28 combined with mandatory e-learning. To me, it's just completely unacceptable. What gives Ontario its competitive advantage with any jurisdiction around the world is our educated workforce. We're not gonna attract investment because we're, we're gonna pay the lowest wages, or we have the lowest cost of living, or we're gonna you know, like pillage our natural resources. It's because we have an incredibly educated workforce. And the foundation of that educated workforce is a strong public school system. And investing in that public school system is absolutely critical. And also, I want to include post-secondary. I know post-secondary isn't a part of the debate right now. But if you look at the biggest cut, the two biggest cuts in the fall economic statement were to post-secondary education, especially student aid programs, $670 million. And the second one, and I want people, because this is a rural riding mostly, the second one was the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. So I got up in the House and the immediate statement I made when I gave my response to the minister was, I love farmers. I love rural communities. Why are they taking the biggest cut in your fall economic statement? And I think every rural riding that's represented by a conservative member of the legislature should be asking why the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs took the second biggest cut in last, year's, in, in last year's fall economic statement. Anyway, you want to talk about the future? I think our children are the future. We need to be in investing in those children. Yeah, go ahead. So you said that you went to Bruce Bauer today, so I'm wondering yeah. um, I'm a little <laughs> further away, but it's obviously one of the biggest employers in the area. It is, yeah. And I honestly think like we'll feel it we would struggle to elect somebody in yeah. the Huron Shores being anti-nuclear. Yeah. But um, you know, like, I'm interested in how you see that being a piece of the puzzle because you've been uh, yep. critical of Pickering yep. fairly recently. Yep, absolutely. Um, but I mean, it's also a big time employer too. Like Williams yeah, just announced great question. today that they have a gigantic new contract yep. and they're starting to cycle more of their employees from contract, which I'm sure yep. everybody's familiar with to full-time employees where they're giving mm -hmm. pension and benefits and more people are starting to settle in the area. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously it is, Pickering is expensive because yep. it's getting old and it's aging, but nuclear energy over its lifespan yep. is uh, less expensive. Yeah. And in that example you talked about, we could pipe in energy from China. <coughs> China Christ. Not China. Sorry, guys. Go back. Go back. <laughs> From the dam, but I mean, it's not like dams are, you know, yeah. yes, it's cleaner as Great well. Question. It's clean, but uh, like, Great question. I think it's the Narmada Dam in 2011 or 2012 that sank villages in India, right? Yeah. So it's not like we can, we yeah. have clean Oh, absolutely. Dams, but then right. it, oh, you're absolutely right. So, so, I'm yeah. in so first of all, every source of energy generation has negative aspects to it, period. Solar does, wind does, nuclear does, water power does. Coal obviously does, natural gas does. Every source of generation has challenges and problems. So there is no perfect solution. The best solution is to use less energy and use it more efficiently, which is why it frustrates me and angers me so much that the previous liberal government didn't have a conservation first strategy, even though they had a bill that was named that. In reality, it didn't deliver that. And the current government is actually cut most of the programs to support conservation and energy efficiency. Second, I have never, and even, the, I just really, it frustrates me, we live in this political world now, and I, maybe it's because you have 140 characters on Twitter and seven seconds on the average TV interview, is I have never called for shutting down nuclear power in Ontario. Like we, over 50% of our electricity supply comes from nuclear right now. What I have said is I don't think we should be investing in rebuilding Darlington because of cost reasons more than anything else. The price of power from Darlington is gonna double over the next decade uh, to cover the cost of rebuilding it. And why would you do that when wind is cheaper, solar is cheaper, um, Quebec water power is cheaper, and you're right, water power is not perfect either, but 
the dams there have already been built. So if we can get five cent kilowatt hour power from them versus, you know, paying 15 plus for Darlington, um, you know, I'll take the lower cost power. I have said that Bruce, the refurbishment that's already been done at Bruce, means we're going to be getting nuclear power out of Bruce at least till 2045, at least. Because why would we shut down something that we've already invested billions of dollars into and that, that generates over 50% of Ontario's electricity supply? But I think we need to gradually over time transition away from nuclear and the primary reason is cost. It is, it is quickly becoming the most expensive source of power generation in Ontario. Wind is cheaper, solar is cheaper, um, biomass isn't yet, but it's getting close. Uh, water power is cheaper, and obviously conservation and energy efficiency. That doesn't mean nuclear is not going to be part of our mix. It will be part of our mix, absolutely. I think it should be a declining share of our energy mix. It's 60% now. It shouldn't be 60% in 2050. So um, as we move to 100% uh, carbon neutral grid, uh, it, most of that new power is going to come from low cost renewable energy and more efficient use of electricity. Yeah. I'm good to keep going. I would never deny Lee an opportunity to ask a question, <laughs> especially because she's hosting. And there's a young, there's a young woman over here who has her hand up too. So we'll do, we'll, we'll hear and then hear. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, my name is Lee. And I wanted to thank Danielle for um, uh, generously saying that I've provided this place. But of course, most people know that Harmony Center is a charity, owns the building, and we're all volunteers here. It's, yeah. it's not my building. I'm just the lucky person that gets to be in the office <laughs> and or, you know, help to organize these kinds of events. Other thing I want to say, something that you mentioned about how working together is important with different political yeah. parties. And we're really proud that the the Greens use this place, and NDP use this place, the Liberals use this place, Great. and the People's Party of Canada use the place too. Fantastic. So that's important for us. My question is about um, conservation of built heritage. Yes. This place is a, an example of that. Yeah. And I know that in the city there's a, a very old and lovely building that is currently being considered for demolition. Uh, there's so much capacity within these buildings already. What does the Green Party have as far as consideration of programs to support people and communities that want to maintain, improve, them yeah. and continue to use them? Yeah. So one of the things we've been strongly advocating for is um, property tax adjustments for heritage buildings to significantly lower or even eliminate property taxes on public benefit heritage buildings because we know that heritage buildings have two big challenges. So one is accessibility requirements under the AODA, um, but we have to deliver accessibility by 2025. Like everybody in this province should be able to access, have accessible access to every building. So we need to help heritage buildings be able to make the renovations necessary to make sure they are accessible. And the second one is energy efficiency and helping us preserve the heritage nature of buildings while upgrading the energy efficiency. And I would say it's, 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 it's critical for a few things. One is heritage buildings just play such a role in the aesthetics of our community, the history of our community, people's knowledge and relationships and memories and connections uh, in these buildings are so critically important. Uh, on the other hand, and at the same time, there's a lot of embodied energy in this building. And why would you destroy all of that embodied energy when you can upgrade and retrofit it and preserve it and maintain its integrity? And so it's coming up with programs that help, help the financial aspects of making sure we can preserve these buildings. It's especially challenging in urban city centers of larger cities, like I'm thinking of Toronto, London, Ottawa, places like that where the property tax on most heritage buildings have become so high that community type organizations can't maintain them anymore. And so that's why I think that aspect of it is so critically important. That may be less of a challenge here, but I'm thinking it's still a challenge in places like Owen Sound. So yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, I said here next, sorry, yes. 
Go for it. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great question. Did everyone hear the question? So why isn't the government putting, having uh, environmental education be part of our curriculum? And are these cuts going to hurt environmental education? Like that's a quick summary. It's a little bit longer, but there are a couple other pieces. So one of the big concerns I have around raising average class sizes is that environmental education programs are on the chopping block. Because again, like in the trades, those are oftentimes courses that um, require smaller class sizes. And so as average class size goes up, those are the kinds of programs that are being cut. So I've had a number of um, students in particular who are part of environmental education programs uh, reach out to me with their concerns. I've been really advocating on this. The other one, and we saw this in Guelph that just broke my heart, um, some of the programs that target at-risk students are on the chopping block as well because a lot of those programs um, have small class sizes. And there was one in Guelph that was canceled this year, just even with the slight increase in class size. And it broke my heart because I had recent graduates of the program come to my office uh, to lobby me, and they were very effective because I then got them to Queens Park and got them a lot of media attention, but unfortunately, it still didn't save the program. They came to me and said, you know what, I wouldn't have graduated if it wouldn't have been for the Cadence program. You know, I would be on the streets, I would probably have an addiction issue, I would have, you know, I wouldn't have been able to have a family, a job, like, without this program. And I'm here as a recent graduate to try to save the program because I want other young people to have the benefits of this program. And so that's what I find just so devastating about the cuts. They're so short-sighted. They're gonna cost us more in the long run. Like the cost of cutting these programs are gonna cost us way more in the long run. Our criminal justice system, our healthcare system, mental health services, um, housing services, like you know, people who are gonna end up on you know, social assistance, um, it'd be so much better to invest in them so they're contributing members of our community. And so that's a great question. I also believe that climate change should be a mandated part of our curriculum. It's something we've been advocating for. I don't think most people even understand climate science. Like People don't understand that CO2 that was put into the atmosphere 100 years ago is still in the atmosphere. And so there, I think there's this min misplaced mentality that oh, when it gets so bad, we'll just stop polluting and we'll fix the problem. They don't realize like, the pollution isn't going anywhere. It's like all there. It's going to be there for a long time. And so every day we delay creates a bigger and bigger problem. And I think a lot of it's because nobody's ever had that education. And so if it was part of our curriculum, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, you're absolutely right. And I just want to say one final one is, is, is there's this mentality, and I think it's driven by the premier more so than his caucus, that somehow university and college education is not necessary. Mm -hmm. That it's like, you know what, I, you know, he, I think he barely went to college and dropped out. And I'm a successful business person, so why do you even need post-secondary? But not everyone, you know, has a parent who has a successful business that they can walk into and inherit. And so um, I don't know if the premier understands how vital post-secondary education and a financial access to post-secondary education is. So again, it breaks my heart to see people who, you know, have had to, to leave post-secondary education because they can't afford it because of the cuts to the OSAP loan program. So good question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lauren. Uh, my husband and I are starting our family, and what concerns me is our autonomy to choose what's right for our child. 
So I'd like to know where you and the Green Party stand on such things as mandating vaccines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just, you know, I support vaccination. And you may just, with that question, you may or may not disagree. I don't know. Um, so I've been a supporter of vaccination, primarily because I think we have to follow the science. And if we're going to ask people to follow climate science, I think we're going to have to ask people to follow health science. Um, I believe in parent choice choice. But I also recognize that um, there are some aspects, particularly I'm looking at like the reemergence of measles outbreaks and other things that we have to be very cautious and careful around to make sure that we're protecting everybody in our community while at the same time maintaining parent and family choice. Hello, I'm Jeremy Thorne. Uh, in the recent federal election, there wasn't really, uh, for me uh, personally, there wasn't as much emphasis on small business as I thought yeah, there might I have agree. been. And I know that you've spoken in favor of small business in, mm -hmm. in, in the past. So I was wondering if you see uh, as, as the, everything, as the election comes up at the provincial level, yep. you see small business benefits uh, sort of becoming part, you know, a, a significant part of the platform and so on. Uh, and if so, what would that kind of yeah. look like? Yeah, so I'm a big advocate. I'm a small business owner myself, longtime small business owner in the food sector, which is why I'm passionate about your food and agriculture questions. Um, so one, I, I, I think one of the things we absolutely have to do is revitalize our small business sector, particularly in the retail sector. Um, you know, the, you know, what Amazon and, and companies like that have done, even you know, large like corporations like Walmart and things like that. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to bash any particular companies in particular, but we need to make sure we have tax structures, both from a property tax standpoint, as well as, as a, as a um, particularly payroll tax standpoint that are supportive of small businesses. We also need to make sure that business support programs are accessible for small businesses. Most of those programs go to large companies which isn't to say I'm, you know, like the gentleman who asked, how do we get big business involved? Uh, I'm more than happy to incentivize big business to go carbon neutral. But we also need to make sure those types of programs and supports are accessible to small businesses because oftentimes they're not because of the paperwork burden. It's very cumbersome for small business. So having, having programs that are, having some of those programs set aside specifically for small businesses so they don't have that disadvantage. The big one for me, and, and this came up a lot during the debate over raising the minimum wage, I'm a huge supporter of a, a guaranteed livable income through a basic income, but also through raising the minimum wage as well. So I was a big supporter of $15 an hour minimum wage, and I know some small businesses raise concerns around that in terms of how it would affect their cash flow. And so the thing we were advocating for was lower payroll taxes on small businesses, while increasing the minimum wage. So we provide immediate cash flow relief to small businesses so they can hire more people and pay their employees a higher wage, while at the same time helping them immediately with their month to month cash flow. And so to me, it's those types of, business, those types of decisions to say, hey, we can support small businesses and we can support workers having a living wage. And that will benefit our local economy because the bottom line is, is is lower income workers spend most of their income and they spend most of it locally in the economy. Can't afford vacations to, you know, exotic places or whatever. It's spent in the local community. So it's actually gonna generate and benefit more local economic development. Likewise, small businesses tend to spend their money locally, hiring local accountants, local lawyers. They advertise locally. You know, they don't, the, the money isn't just spent in big corporate offices. So by having a policy like that, um, you, you benefit uh, local economies in a way that then benefits local municipal tax revenues, which then allows for more investment in strong, vibrant local communities. Okay, are we wrapping up here? I think I've probably gone over time, but that's okay. Um, I love chatting with people. So I just, can I just close on one thing? It's just one is, is thank you so much for, being a great candidate, organizing tonight. Um, I just, and, and so thanks for, and thanks for getting all of you out here tonight. 
because if there would be one like take home message I would give is get this group together or a portion of this group and talk about what's, what's a campaign you want to do locally. What's an issue you want to uh, tackle and how can you mobilize around that? And then come to us for resources because we've got both financial resources as well as templates to help you with that kind of organizing. Because at the end of the day, um, like I said, you know, hopefully you know, you'll get elected or whoever runs. I don't want to put pressure on you to that you'll be the next candidate. You or whoever the next candidate is, you know, it's, it's a pathway to getting elected. But more importantly, it's a pathway to delivering real change to benefit this community. And that's what the most important outcome is. I always tell people, it's like, you know, if I want to get elected, but in some ways I don't care if I get elected. As long as the policies that we're fighting for, the vision we have for this province, this community, this country, as long as that's delivered on, that's what matters. And so I would really, my take home message would be to like, go for it. So thank you for so much. Uh, reach out to my office anytime. You're welcome to come anytime you want to come out and visit. And thank you so much for all the great work you do in this community. repeat offenders amongst that, um, but please let me know what you are, what you're thinking, and uh, let's get Bruce Gray, Own Sound Greens, out there again, and part of this community, and visible, and um, all those things that we should be, let's be the pride for you, let's be out there cleaning up garbage, and doing those things that are, um, that benefit our community no matter the outcome, I love that, I love that, so thank you very much. <laughs>